I was driving down the never-ending Trans-Canada Highway. The only sound inside the car was the hum of the tires on the pavement beneath me, and the blast of the heater as it fanned hot air onto the windshield, keeping it clear of frost. It was quiet in the car. Too quiet. Greg shit his pants. No, I didn't. And it was just a fart, asshole. Anyways, whoever smelt it dealt it, right, Dad? Greg, stop farting on everybody and read the rules for the winter camping badge again, so that the whole troop knows what they're in for this weekend. I already read them. Well, do it again. Steve wasn't listening. I could hear him snoring from up here. Steve. Steve. Steve! Wake up. My dad said so. Eh? Huh? Wake up, Steve. We're going over the rules again for your own personal benefit, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, Mr. Grip. I'm awake. For winter camping honors, scouts must erect a tent in the snow and spend one night outside during winter months. Sufficient cold weather gear must be worn at all times, and the scout leader will verify... As he went on about the rules, I let my mind relax briefly and looked at the road ahead again. Snow was piled up on either side of Highway 7, and the pavement was slushy but well salted. The landscape was so different up here in the winter, I thought to myself. I had only ever been up to the cabin in the summer. Ever since I can remember, I've been going up north every year to Bronze Lake. My family cabin sits at the end of a narrow peninsula, which serves as a grassy driveway to our tiny shack of a cabin. No electricity, no running water, no furnace. We would be chopping our own wood and building fires to stay warm. But the forecast had predicted mild weather, and we had plenty of blankets and warm weather gear. Be prepared, that's what they always say, so we brought all kinds of gear with us. I had gone for my winter camping badge when I was a kid, and had fond memories of the experience. We had gone hiking and had snowball fights and made s'mores around the campfire. But this was different. I suddenly realized with dawning apprehension. I had gone to a scout camp, and there had been plenty of other people around. Not to mention a heated cabin to go into when we got cold. The minivan had plenty of gas, and could keep us warm in an emergency. Unless it breaks down, a voice in my mind said. I tried to shrug it off. Right, Dad? I realized my son Greg had been talking to me while I zoned out. What's that, Greg? I said the turn is coming up soon. I almost missed it, but slowed down just in time, and turned onto the gravel side road. Here we go. Another 15 minutes or so and we'll be there. You guys excited? Yeah, came the timid reply from the back. Suddenly the five of them were so quiet. Could they sense my apprehension? What do you guys want to do first when we get to the lake? You want to go ice fishing or have a snowball fight? Snowball fight! The chatter started up again, and I was happy they were conversing again, at least, and seemed excited. The side roads were icy and more slippery than the highway, and I slowed down considerably to navigate them. I heard Gibson whining from the seat next to me and reached over to quickly stroke her fur. Our old cocker spaniel was getting up in years, but she had always loved going up to the cabin. Even she seemed nervous, though, I thought. Maybe she just needed to pee. We'll be there in a minute, Gibby, I told her soothingly. My words didn't reassure her. Instead, her ears perked up and she suddenly sat bolt upright in the passenger seat. Her eyes were wide and looking ahead. I looked out the windshield again just in time to see something tall and lanky ducking into the trees ahead. It disappeared into the woods and was impossible to see as we drove past. A hunter, I assumed. Just a very tall one. The man was easily seven foot. Gibson settled down into the passenger seat, and I turned onto Brookside Road. It was even less well-maintained, and the salt was sparse, causing the car to skid occasionally on the black ice. Continuing on the road for a while, I kept my eyes open for the sign that would turn onto Dresher Lane. The gravel would turn into just two ruts of dirt in the grass once we reached that turn, and in the winter, with all the snow on the ground, we wouldn't even have that. I wondered if I would be able to drive up the steep hill that led to the cabin or if we would have to walk the kilometer or so from there. Here it is, boys, I announced, seeing the blue street sign they had put up the year before. Dresher Lane. Gibson sat up as well to look, and all the boys quieted in the back. 
We'd been driving for hours, and they were anxious to see the cabin where we'd be spending the weekend. I was surprised to see the gate sitting open. Mr. Drescher had forgotten to close it, I supposed. Their property sat on the side of the road leading in, as did a few other cottages. We all knew each other up here, and I wondered if somebody was up on the lake ice fishing. That would be a relief, I thought. Just to have somebody else around would be nice in case of emergency. Seeing a car parked in the space beside the Drescher's cottage made me break into a big smile. I wouldn't have to be the only responsible grown-up on the lake for the weekend. Even if we never interacted, just their presence would be reassuring. I rolled down the window as we passed and saw Mr. Drescher coming out of his cottage. He appeared to be loading up his car to go home, I realized. My heart sank. So much for backup. Mr. Drescher, I guess we're just catching you on your way out. I called out the window to him. He appeared surprised to see us. He walked over to his car and put his suitcase inside hurriedly, then came over to the driver's side window of the minivan, taking quick little steps to avoid slipping on the ice. Oh, well, hello there, young Mr. Grip. Ah, and you've got the scout troop with you as well, I see. Very, uh, good to see you all out here. He looked nervous, and his eyes met mine and locked onto them. Can you help me to bring a couple things out? I'm getting on in years, and my arthritis is acting up something fierce with this cold weather. Sure, I said. It was strange. I, I had never talked to the man that much, but of course I was happy to help. I got out of the van after putting the parking brake on, and left it running to keep the boys warm while I helped Mr. Drescher. Following him inside, he closed the door behind us. Listen, he said. This is a mistake. You shouldn't be up here. You should turn around and go back. Just make up an excuse. Say whatever you have to. But do not spend the night here. The old man was losing it, I realized suddenly. What the hell was he talking about? What do you mean, Mr. Drescher? We just got up here. We, we drove five hours to get here. I started backing away from him as he twitched, and I saw a bit of foamy dribble pouring from the corner of his mouth. I found the doorknob behind me with my hand. I turned around to look, and he was on me, grabbing my shirt collar and pulling me towards him. He screamed at me with his face reddened and his eyes streaming tears. Do not stay the night tree. I am begging you. The owls watch as insatiable wolves feast and foraging mushrooms run rampant. I pushed him off of me and ran back to the van and pulled the door handle, my feet slipping on the ice and almost sending me flying. I grabbed the door and managed to stay upright, then leapt inside and hit the gas, driving off as we heard the old man screaming at us from the driveway. Don't stay here. It's going to get cold. There will be no one to save you from him. His voice faded in the distance. The boys didn't say anything. I could sense six sets of eyes on me as the dog and all of them stared at me. Sorry, boys, I stammered. He's, uh, he's not usually like that. Is that supposed to make us feel better? Peter, the troublemaker, yelled from the back seat. I wasn't sure what to say. The whole weekend seemed to be going off the rails. Was he right? Should, should we just go back? I would have to double check the weather forecast once we got there, but... It had called for good weather just this morning when we left. Still, this whole thing seemed like a bad omen. This whole guy is probably just off his meds, Steve muttered. More likely he's self-medicating a bit too much with some mushrooms of questionable legality, I thought to myself. Gibson was whining at me from the passenger seat, sitting up and staring at me, her eyes wide and worried. I kept left at the fork in the road and the tires spun a few times in the icy slush but we managed to get up the steep hill leading to the cabin. The woods closed in on both sides and all around us, suffocating in a way that I found vaguely uncomfortable in the snow, which was strange because I had always loved the forest up here. We passed the other cottages and saw no one else was on the lake, at least so far. Still, I held out hope for a few ice fishermen, who sometimes visited in the colder months. At least that's what my uncle had told me. He always enjoyed ice fishing and visited the lake occasionally in the winter. The lake closed in on both sides as we neared the cottage and began to drive down the narrow peninsula. At the lowest point, the water was just a foot away on either side, and this section occasionally flooded, rendering it impassable. 
Finally, we drove over a rise and around a bend and the cabin came into sight. The boys groaned from the back seat when they saw it. This is it? It's just a freaking shack. I told you guys it wasn't much. It was slightly irritating hearing them criticize our family cabin, but they were just kids, so I shrugged it off. I turned the car around in the slightly less narrow spot we used for that purpose and backed the van right up to the front door to unload our supplies. Relief flooded me once again when I looked out on the lake and saw a fishing hut out there. It appeared well maintained and there were tracks leading up to it and around it. We weren't alone after all. There would be other people on the lake for the weekend, and in case of emergency I could always call on them for help. If the battery died in the minivan, for instance. It wasn't like we could call roadside assistance out here. And besides, the cell signal was spotty at best on the lake. Look boys, ice fishermen. Maybe they can show us a thing or two on how to cut a hole in the ice. What, you don't know how to do that? Peter piped up. My dad says any idiot can cut a hole for ice fishing. I tried to come up with a snappy remark, but came up empty. Instead, I settled for muttering something under my breath and getting out and slamming the door behind me. Damn kid was already getting on my nerves. Gibson was at my heels as I unlocked the door to the cabin and stepped inside. It was cold in there, but at least there was no wind. It was whipping pretty fiercely off the lake and felt brutally frigid out there. I went through the cabin and checked every room for wildlife and potential weather damage. We've always had problems with mice, and occasionally bats would get inside. But the place was fine, and there hadn't been any damage from early winter storms. Just the standard scatterings of mouse turds, cobwebs, and spiders. The first goal in my mind was to get some wood in the fireplace and start to warm up the cabin. We would have to keep it burning at all times, and I would need to remind the boys to stoke the fire, and keep the front and back doors closed so the place stayed warm. I went out the front door and found the boys were already building snow forts, at a distance of about 15 feet from each other. They were amassing piles of snowballs for an impending battle as well. Since there were five of them, it would be three on two. Slightly uneven odds. And the snow forts were already showing signs of that, since the one on the right was already larger. No sense interrupting, I decided, and just fetch the wood myself. You're only a kid once, after all. I would build the fire and get it going while they had their fun. In an hour or two, they would need to start assembling their tent, since it got dark early up here. I found some dry wood beneath the cabin where we stored piles of it, but kindling was another story altogether. It was harder to find small pieces of dry wood, and by the time I found enough, my feet were beginning to feel frozen and frostbitten. Back in the cabin, Gibson watched as I built a little teepee structure in the fireplace. She had been playing with the boys for a while, but was now following me and watching me closely again. I couldn't help but get the continued impression that she was nervous about something. The slightly damp wood took a while to catch fire, but eventually I managed to get it burning. I would have to keep an eye on it, I realized, as it was being temperamental at times. I went out front and called the boys from their snowball fight. They moaned and groaned for a minute, but then came over to the front door of the cabin, their faces red from the cold, but still no signs of wanting to come inside. I spoke from the top of the stairs and told them my expectations. They would have to start work on their tent immediately, since it was getting dark in a couple of hours. Three of you will sleep outside tonight. Two tomorrow night, since we only have the one tent. Any volunteers to go in the tent tonight? I noticed Peter, the constant pain in the ass, didn't volunteer for the first night. Greg and Steve and Ricky stuck up their hands after a few moments' hesitation. Okay, so it'll be Greg, Ricky, and Steve tonight. Peter and Jeff tomorrow night. So you two are in the cabin with me and Gibson tonight, okay? Help them put up the tent, and then you can all come inside and get warmed up by the fire for a while. They gave their reluctant assent, and I went back inside and left them to their work. I remembered it being brutally cold when I had done my winter camping badge. I had kept my boots on all night and was afraid to even go outside to pee, thinking I wouldn't be able to get warm again afterwards. But I also remembered feeling like I had really accomplished something, and I was proud of myself for that. I checked the fire. It was guttering again, and I stoked it for a few minutes and put fresh wood on it to get it going again. Everything was a bit damp, and at this rate the cabin would never get warm. I looked over and saw Gibson was shivering. I pulled her close to me and hugged her near as the fire warmed my hands. The kettle caught my eye, and I remembered that hot chocolate was a thing that existed. What better way to bribe the boys into thinking I was a good scout leader and professional adult? I filled the blackened old kettle up with water, 
and put it on the stove to boil. Then I grabbed the box of instant hot chocolate from our food supplies. The place was beginning to warm up slightly, which was nice, but I still kept my hat and gloves on. At least the dog was no longer shivering. By the time the boys came inside, I had mugs of hot chocolate ready for them, and they each drank theirs in big gulps without complaint, taking turns warming their hands by the fire and playing with the dog. There were suddenly wet boot prints all throughout the cabin, despite my constant reminders to take off shoes before coming inside. But I decided to let that slide and took out the guitar, while the boys made hot dogs and s'mores in the little indoor stove. The cottage was warm and lit with flickering light, and the glow of a half dozen kerosene lamps. I nearly had a heart attack each time the boys got near one of them, and was constantly yelling at them to be careful, since tipping over one could easily be the death of us all. As the night wore on and after songs were sung and hot dogs were roasted and eaten, I decided it was time for bed. The three boys, including my son Greg, were sent out into the cold winter air to sleep in their tent for the night, to receive their winter camping badges. I felt a pang of regret and deep concern sending the three of them out there. Gibson began to whine and scratch at the door after they left, and wouldn't leave that spot. She fell asleep on the damp welcome mat later that night. I had a very difficult time falling asleep. The fire kept going out and I kept getting up to put more wood on and to try to get it going again. Gibson eventually got too cold and came over to the fire while I was poking it, trying to coax more heat from the embers. She was shivering and I brought her up onto the sofa bed with me. Peter and Jeff were sleeping in cots near the fire and looked warm enough in their sleeping bags. But I was freezing since I kept having to get up to manage the fire. I managed to fall into a fitful sleep, and had a terrible nightmare. There was something clawing at the windows and doors of the cabin. The wind was howling outside and the fire had long ago gone out. In my dream, I stood up from the bed and saw the two boys were frozen to death in their cots. They were blue with hypothermia, and there was frost everywhere inside the cabin. The windows were covered in ice which was spreading rapidly, like a fungus and fast forward. Someone or something is scratching on the windows and the doors on all sides. The sound is like nails on a blackboard. Like something with talons or long claws dragging them across the surface. My heart is pounding. My throat is dry. I woke up and sat bolt upright, my body covered in cold sweat. That sound. I can feel my heartbeat in my throat. My stomach feels like a ball of lead as I walk to the door. Gibson is scratching at it in a panic. At first I think she just needs to pee again, but then I hear the sounds of screaming from outside. You're gone! Mr. Grapp! Greg and Ricky and Steve, they're gone! Where'd they go? I ran over to the tent through the freshly fallen snow. There were no tracks anywhere to indicate someone coming and taking them. Nothing to indicate they had left to go for an early morning hike. They were just gone. Their sleeping bags empty and the tent abandoned. Gibson looked up at me with her brown eyes wide and worried. I'm not sure. They'll be back. They probably just went for a hike or something. But part of me knew that wasn't true. The weather was very cold. And a voice in my mind whispered back to me. You shouldn't have stayed here. You should have left when you had the chance. I realized I was lying face down in the snow, and that someone, a child, was yelling at me. Mr. Grep, Mr. Grep, are you okay? Oh geez, now he's passed out too? What kind of a scout leader? I struggled to get to my feet and found the world was spinning. Gibson was looking up at me worriedly, as were Jeff and Peter, the two remaining Boy Scouts from my troop that had started out as five. My son, as well as the other two, Ricky and Steve, were now gone. They had disappeared into the night, vanished without a trace in the snowstorm. They had wanted to earn their winter camping badges, which had required that they sleep outdoors in a tent during the winter. But it had gotten so cold during the night, we had also gotten a massive downpour of snow, which had blanketed the lake in a large quantity of fresh powder. How had I not noticed it happening? 
I should have been checking on them, I realized. I hadn't even gone out to look in on them. Who knew how long they had been gone? What kind of a scout leader was I? What kind of a father? The boys were yelling at me, but I only heard it as a vague background noise, as well as the ringing in my ears that was my chronic tinnitus. That was when I looked out onto the lake and saw the fishing hut. Maybe that's where the boys had gone. Of course. It had been cold in the tent and they had decided to go over and see if they could cheat by sneaking off to the warmth of the fishing hut. Their tracks had just been covered by the freshly fallen snow. I ran down to the lake and out onto the ice, sprinting as quickly as I could through the snow and towards the fishing hut. Racing across the ice and through the thick snow took a while, but I eventually arrived at the little hut and looked in the door, praying that the three boys would be inside. But the door had been left open and snow was drifting in. There was no one in the hut, but the interior was splattered with vast quantities of blood. It was frozen on the walls and ceiling. The hole in the ice had been covered by the snow blowing in and the place looked abandoned. I saw a six pack of beer cans, unopened, sitting on the ground in the corner, frozen in a pool of congealed blood. Tackle and fishing rods were scattered haphazardly everywhere but there was no sign of anyone aside from the blood. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I felt like I couldn't focus with the overwhelming terror I was feeling for my son. And myself, if I'm being honest. Whoever had done this was a violent madman. Unless it was animals, wolves maybe? My mind grappled with the possibilities. Was it possible that whoever was in the fishing hut had hurt the boys and taken them away somewhere? The other boys were yelling something from the shore, and I heard their voices rise up in panicked urgency. Help! I looked back and saw Mr. Drescher was there, and he was yanking on Peter's wrist, while Jeff flailed his arms at him, ineffectively punching him in the belly. Stop it! yelled Jeff. You must leave! You must go from here! It isn't safe for you! As I ran back towards the shore, I saw dark clouds rolling in. The sky was full of them, coming in from the head of the lake. And with them came the blowing wind, nearly knocking me from my feet as I ran through the blowing snow. It obscured my vision, and I couldn't see what was happening with the boys. What the hell was he doing to them? My face went numb and somehow felt full of pins and needles and pain at the same time. The wind was suddenly very cold. I pulled up my jacket and ran as I yelled at the madman to stop and leave the damn kids alone. Finally, after what felt like forever, I reached them and pulled him off of Peter. I shoved the old man hard and he fell to the ground, looking defiant and angry as he struggled to get up in the deep snow. Ah, he hurt my arm! Peter was screaming, and I saw it was indeed hanging unnaturally at his side. Jeff was screaming as well and crying, and Gibson was barking taking the odd, attempted bite at Mr. Drescher's legs. His pants had holes from her teeth already, and I could see his socks were drenched in blood from her bites. She was usually so friendly. Get your damn beast away from me! He was yelling, crab-walking away from her in the snow. It's with him! It's doing his bidding! I got a hold of Gibson's collar. Not because I was worried for his safety so much as hers. It was clear what had happened now. This maniac had taken the boys, and maybe he had killed those people in the fishing hut. Where are they? What did you do with my son? His face broke into a grin that stretched high on his face like a joker. Broad front teeth and lips red from the cold, peeled and broken with dried skin, stretched taut and bleeding. He took them. It wasn't me. <laughs> he took them. Yes. For some reason, I didn't trust him. Don't ask me why. Maybe it was the fact that he had just been trying to kidnap the other two boys. I made him take us to his cottage, thinking the boys would be there. I tried to drive over in the minivan, but it wouldn't start, as if the battery were dead. This caused me to nearly break down into a full-blown panic attack, but I took some deep breaths and tried to calm down and keep myself focused. We needed to get out of there, I realized. There was a storm rolling in. We had caught a bit of it overnight, but now I could see the black clouds were very close and threatening. The snow was already starting up again. We made Mr. Drescher walk just ahead of us so we could keep an eye on him. 
Peter was screaming the whole time and cradling his arm. I just hoped that Mr. Dresher's car was better equipped for the snow and would be able to get us out of here. He would get his wish and we would leave, if we could, and we would be taking him straight to the nearest police station. But when we arrived at his cottage after a long, trudging walk through the snow, the other three boys weren't there. We searched the whole cottage and found nothing. I questioned him about it some more, but it was clear he wasn't going to talk. I was worried perhaps he had hidden them in a shack out in the woods somewhere, or perhaps in a different cottage that he had keys to. I worried they could be tied up somewhere, freezing to death, getting colder by the minute as this maniac stalled us with his bullshit. The car keys were hanging from a hook by the front door, so I tried to start it, thinking we could drive around to the other cottages and at least check and see if the boys were there. But the car wouldn't start. Mr. Dresher began to laugh as I got out and opened the hood. I know almost nothing about cars, but I can tell when all of the spark plugs are missing from one. You son of a bitch, where are they? The boys? Or the spark plugs? He cackled again. Trudging back to our cabin, the snow really began to fall. It became hard to see in the constant white haze of snow, and I made the boys walk close together behind me in single file. I told them to keep track of each other, buddy system style. We were freezing cold by the time we got back to the cottage. Peter seemed to be in shock, and I realized I had no choice. We would have to ride it out. Hopefully the boys would come back on their own. Maybe they were on a little hike after all. But I really doubted it. Mr. Dresher didn't even fight when I tied him to the chair. I told him it was just for a little while, and he just smiled and nodded, then began to hum to himself off-key. I told Jeff to make a fire. It would keep him busy and allow me time to look at Peter's arm. I had a feeling it was dislocated. Judging by his constant screaming, and the way it was hanging malformed at his side. Hold still, I told him. This is gonna hurt. I pulled on his arm and he screamed. I hate you, I hate you, I want to go home! Peter was pissed. I couldn't really blame him. I had dislocated my own shoulder once playing football, and the coach had popped it back in on the sidelines. It was not a good time. At least he wasn't shivering and sitting there with a thousand-yard stare anymore, so that was good. I guessed. Jeff had gotten the fire going, but it was still freezing in the cottage. I looked out the window and saw nothing but white. Mr. Dresher continued to hum softly off-key, which gave everything an even more unsettling feeling. Please stop that. He ignored me. The wind began to howl outside, and the walls of the cabin shook with the force of it, trembling from the power of the mighty gusts rolling in off the lake all around us. Gibson was laying on the ground with her head down, looking scared and shivering again. I moved her closer to the fire and sat with her, rubbing her old fur and trying to warm her up. I pulled Peter over as well and made him sit near the fire with us. Jeff was still stoking it with more wood, and he had it going pretty well. Hey, good job, Jeff. We got that fire going great, man. I love fire, he said back quietly. Setting fires is the one thing I'm good at. I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear that for now. Just promise me you won't set the cabin on fire, at least, and we'll just... We'll talk about that later. Holy shit. I was going to have to have a talk with Jeff's parents once we got back to town. Add that to the list. Peter was looking over with wide eyes. Dude, you're so fucking weird. I know. He stared at the glowing embers of the fire. I had brought in a whole pile of wood the night before, so we had enough fuel for the fire. And at least it was getting drier by the minute. It would just be a matter of waiting out the storm. But I was terrified for my son. He was out there somewhere. He and his friends had to be alive. I, I just knew it. We waited for a couple of hours for the dangerous winds and snow to subside so that we could mount a proper search before dark. It was past noon when we heard a sound at the door, like someone was coming up the front steps. I sprang to my feet, thinking it could be Greg. Running to the front door, I tried to open it against the wind, but found it nearly impossible. With all of my body weight pushed against it, I shoved it open and looked outside. Steve was out there. My son's friend who lived down the street from us but the rest of them were nowhere to be seen. 
I ran down to help him up the stairs, and that was when I saw that his left eye was missing. The orbital socket was an empty hole and was weeping blood. He was swaying on his feet and looked exhausted. His coat was ripped to tatters and his face was bloodied. He was talking like he had a concussion, slurring his words as he spoke. He came for us, Mr. Grepp. He just came right up. Take this up, but this is nothing. He's carried us away. He made me watch. He made me watch. He broke down into sobbing, and I picked him up and helped him up the stairs. His nose was bright red and crusty with frost, as were his cheeks, eyelashes, and mouth. I brought him over to the fire, and he recoiled at the sight of Mr. Drescher tied to the chair in the corner. Was it him? Was he the one who took you? No. No, not him. The tall man. Mr. Drescher leaned forward and spoke softly to the boy. You saw him. You saw him and he let you go. Oh. That means he's coming here. Because he doesn't let anyone go. Not ever. Just lets them go back to their friends for a little while to tell their story. To make them more afraid. He loves your fear. Almost as much as he loves the cold. And the hunger of his victims. Keep your bellies full. Don't be afraid to eat in these troubling times now. Trust me. You will want to keep full. My stomach growled and I heard a loud scratching sound coming from the kitchen window. Then from the back door. Then the front door. And the sides. And all around us all at once. It was the sound of nails on a chalkboard. The same as in my nightmare. What the hell is that noise? Peter whined. The noise of the howling wind and scratching sounds combined with the laughter of Mr. Drescher. The nervous barking of my dog. Two boys weeping. And not to mention the crackling of a fire being poked by a burgeoning young pyromaniac. What exactly had I gotten myself into here? We were trapped inside the cabin during the worst snowstorm I had ever seen in my life. Peter, the eldest of the three remaining scouts in my troop, was still nursing his dislocated shoulder and watching Jeff the young pyromaniac, while he stoked the fire with an absent look in his eye. Mr. Drescher, my deranged neighbor, was still tied to a chair and humming a tune that sounded vaguely familiar but I couldn't place for quite a while. Then I realized what it was. The theme song from Price is Right. Son of a bitch, that song was catchy as hell. Pretty soon I'd be humming it too. There was also the desperate and insistent scratching, clawing, and scraping noises coming from every door and a few of the windows. It sounded like animals, and the noise was becoming more desperate by the minute. Despite how fucked up all of that probably sounds, my main priority at that moment was to tend to Steve, the boy from my scout troop who had just returned from the blizzard that was raging outside. Black clouds were overhead and the trees were being blown sideways from the gusts off the lake. What happened out there, Steve? Where's Greg and Ricky? You said the tall man took them. Took them where? I realized I was bombarding him with questions and stopped to let him speak. We were in the tent. Both of us woke up because it was so cold all of a sudden. That was when we heard the screaming. It sounded like it was coming from the lake. We were about to go to your cabin to get you, but... We were scared that it was wolves or something, and... And that we... They'd get in if we left the tent. He stopped and looked at the front door where the scratching and clawing sounds were loudest. What the hell is that, Mr. Grepp? What's at the door? I don't know, Steve. And I don't think I want to know. Just keep talking. Let's try to ignore all that for now. We're safe in here. I think they could all sense the doubt in my voice because they each looked at me, including Gibson, my loyal dog, who was sitting on the floor by my feet. She had been growling low and quietly the whole time, but just then stopped to look at me with her big brown eyes. I stroked her fur reassuringly and urged Steve again to continue. 
the man, I don't know if he really was a man, but he kind of looked like one. He unzipped the tent and came inside and grabbed us up. Just scooped us up with his giant arms. He was so tall. He grabbed us and no matter how hard we fought, it didn't matter. He just dragged us away through the snow. It was coming down so hard I could see it covering up our tracks that we got carried away. I was worried he wouldn't find us, so I, I kept track of things like you taught us. I looked for the landmarks. Good, son. That's, that's damn good work. I'm so sorry this happened to you. This is all my fault. I should have never brought us up here. Mr. Drescher stopped his humming to chuckle quietly to himself. <laughs> I told you, but you wouldn't listen, he said in a sing-song voice. You could have gotten away if you'd only listened. I can't believe what I'm saying, but I actually have to agree with the old guy, Mr. Grep. You fucked up. You fucked up bad. Watch your language, Peter. Keep going, Steve. What happened after that? Where'd he take you, boys? Where's Greg? Is he still alive? Please let him be alive. I think so. His eyes looked far off and confused suddenly. Ricky, he's not, though. Ricky's dead, Mr. Grep. I saw him rip out his throat and took him inside and swallowed him up. He ate them. Ate his insides. Why did he eat them, Mr. Grep? What the hell is it? It's not a person, Mr. Grep. It can't be a person. The answer for that I couldn't think of. I didn't know enough about these things. I'd heard of snow monsters and Wendigo, but knew little about them. Abominable snowmen and creatures born of the frost and cold were a mystery to me. But that seemed like what we were dealing with. Something supernatural. Something out of lore and legend lost to time and believed to be a myth. Suddenly the scratching sounds from the windows and doors stopped. I realized then what it had reminded me of. The dog when she wanted to come inside from the backyard after a pee on a cold day. There was a loud thud and a bang from the front of the cabin, which shook the whole structure on its foundations. I heard the sound of tearing flesh and blood splashing a moment later. The sounds of something being devoured were plainly obvious. The crunching of bones and slurping and gnawing noises were loud and easy to hear. Something had been trying to get in. Not to get at us but to get away from that thing. And whatever it was, it was now just outside. It's coming for you next. The beast is just outside. He is always hungry, no matter how much he eats, for it only makes him leaner, taller, and more ravenous. He is ancient and empty inside. Mr. Drescher was really starting to get on my nerves. How about I throw you out there? See if that scares him off. I half-joked. He balked at that, but then quickly flashed his tobacco-stained Joker's grin again. You wouldn't dare. The more I thought about it, though, the more I realized I had been the one who was wrong. I should have listened to him from the beginning. He had been the one trying to tell us to leave. But then, why had he taken the spark plugs? Why did you sabotage the van? And your own car? I thought you wanted us to leave, so let us leave. Mr. Drescher looked at me like I was an idiot. I didn't take them, you fool. He did. Just like he took mine. I went out on the lake, saw the men had been murdered by him, and ran back to get the hell out of here, but it was already too late for me. He had already put his hex on me by then. I can think halfway straight every so often, but for the most part, I've completely lost it. I can see that. You think I can't see that? But I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. That's why I'm happy you tied me up here. That's why I didn't fight it. Because I can hear him whispering to me. Whispering in my ear. Like he's standing right there beside me. I looked over, and for just a moment I could see a dark and malevolent shadow leaning down and beside his ear, 
just a vague outline of darkness that was quickly gone like a puff of smoke disappearing in the drafty corner of the cabin. And what does he say to you, Mr. Drescher? His eyes were wide and frightened as he looked up at me. Don't ask me that, Mr. Grip. Ask your boy Stevie over there. I looked and saw Steve had a blank look in his eyes. The noises from outside had stopped for the time being, and we were left in silence. What does he mean, Steve? Do you have any idea what he's talking about? The thousand-yard stare didn't go away, but he did shake his head, no. Still, I had a feeling he knew more than he was saying. I had already taken out the first aid kit, and now got to work patching Steve's eye with gauze and sterilizing his wounds with alcohol. He didn't even flinch when I poured it onto the gaping cuts in his flesh. I saw there was a large bump and an open wound that looked pretty nasty on the back of his head. That probably accounted for his slurred speech. I dumped a generous amount of rubbing alcohol on that as well. He's going to need a CAT scan and an MRI when we get home, I'll bet. Jeff had the fire going steadily, and I was afraid to ask him to leave it since it had gotten so cold outside, and he clearly had a skill for maintaining it. But I told him to go up and make some sandwiches for everyone, since he was the only non-injured member of the group not currently tied to a chair. Peter was instructed to keep the fire going in Jeff's absence, which he groaned and complained about, despite the lack of work that would entail. After finishing the final bandages on Steve's forehead, I tried to think of how we could rescue my son. Calling the police was out of the question with the storm. The cell phone had no signal. And if I left him alone with that monster and went to get help on foot, he would be dead before anybody could find him. That thing was insatiable in its hunger, at least from all the evidence we had seen. It wasn't trying to get into the cabin, which meant it wasn't all-powerful. It somehow knew it couldn't get past the sturdy doors and windows. Either that, or it was just toying with us, waiting for us to come out. Mr. Drescher had said that it fed on our fear. But was that true, or just more insane rambling? You keep acting like you know everything about it, so... How do we kill it? Can you tell me that, at least? I yelled at Mr. Drescher. Oh, you can't kill him. He won't let you. Men have tried before, and none have lived to tell of it. What is he? Do you even know what he is? He's a Wendigo. You should know that by now. A dark spirit. It infects people like a sickness. It takes them over. And it's contagious. That's the worst part of Wendigo psychosis. It doesn't just stop with one person. So is that what's happening to you? It's making you crazy? Oh, yes. Quite insane. In fact, I can see all sorts of quite elaborate and colorful hallucinations occurring all around us. But I'm attempting to ignore them in order to convey this highly important information to you all, while I'm temporarily still lucid enough to do so. So in other words, please shut the fuck up and listen. Got it. Listen very carefully, if you want to get your son back. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, I really shouldn't laugh, but that's too much. You really are stupid, though. You knew that, right? I started to turn away, and then he practically screamed it. It makes us want to eat people. Num, num, num. Eat you up. Yum. Fucking Mr. Drescher. He managed to distract me for just long enough. The wind began to howl outside again, and I noticed that Steve was gone from his seat. I thought at first he had gone to help Jeff make sandwiches right after I finished his bandages. The little bugger had slipped away quiet as a mouse. Something about that unsettled me, though. It didn't sit right. Why would he have disappeared like that without saying anything? Thump. That was when I heard the sound like a meat cleaver coming down on a thick, primal cut. I got up from my chair on trembling legs and walked towards the noise. It came again from the pantry. Thump, thuck. Thump, thuck. Thump, thuck. Then, another noise. 
a sound like someone chewing on a very tough steak, gnawing on it, trying to get through the gristle. The darkness in the little pantry room was difficult to see into. I pulled out my flashlight, and it reflected off one inhuman eye that glared back from the recently rescued little boy's face. Steve's mouth was bright red with blood, and I saw Jeff was on the ground beside him, dead, lying in a pool of his own blood. There were parts of him missing. His right hand was gone, and I saw Steve was chewing on it like a drumstick, taking big bites from the palm of his hand like it was fried chicken. Oh, fuck. Steve's eyes flashed in the darkness, and I heard him make an animalistic hissing noise as I stepped backwards, unsure what I was going to do next. He held a large cleaver in his hand that he had snatched from the knife block back there, and I realized that I was unarmed and unprepared for this. Hell no, I'm getting out of here, man! Peter suddenly yelled from behind me. I realized he had snuck up and had witnessed the grisly murder scene unfolding in the storage room. He ran to the front door and unlocked it, then was gone out into the snow, leaving the door hanging open behind him. Peter, come back here! We were both still in our coats and boots because of the cold inside the cabin, but it was a raging blizzard nonetheless. I was worried he was going to die from the elements, if not from the evil Wendigo roaming around. Both seemed equally likely. No way, man! I'll take my chances out here! Maybe I could make it back to the road and get somebody to take me home, but I am not staying here and dying with you. He backed away as he yelled at me, his voice muffled by the howling wind and gusts coming off the lake. I ran out into the snow and followed after him, hearing the laughter of Mr. Drescher turn to horrified screams behind me before they faded in the howling winds. The snow was deep and it was blowing in my face, making it difficult to see. I fell down face first suddenly after stepping awkwardly into a hole with my boot. When I got up to look and see how far away Peter had gotten, I was horrified to see him being picked up by a giant man who appeared to be at least 12 feet tall. He was gaunt and terrifying, his mouth hanging open as he looked back at me and roared. Peter thrashed and screamed as he carried him away and I chased after them, sparing a glance back at the cabin where I'd left the door open in my rush. I saw my dog following after me. Snow was drifting into the cottage, and I thought again of Jeff, decapitated by his fellow scout, and now Mr. Drescher, likely about to meet the same fate. Who knew Steve would turn out to be a cannibal? All part of the Wendigo psychosis, I would find out later. And there was no escaping it once he was in its grasp. I ran after them through the snow, Gibson running behind me at my heels, winding my way through the trees as he went into the forest and then across the lake. Staying in the shadow of the tall birches and pines, I tried to stay hidden along the shoreline, chasing after him as quickly as I could without being seen. Because he took the shortcut across the lake, I almost missed the Wendigo when he got to the other side and quickly vanished into the thick trees up the hill to the north. Following his path without thinking, I came over the hill and spotted him walking swiftly with long strides up ahead. I ran with reckless abandon down the hill and followed after him. His pace was quick, but I sprinted to catch up. Gibson seemed to sense the need for stealth and proceeded quietly with me, not wandering too far ahead or lagging too far behind. Deep in the woods after a while of chasing him, my legs feeling like blocks of wood completely numb from the cold and intense effort, I saw him go into a shack hidden in the thicket, camouflaged well from intruders. If I hadn't seen him enter, I would have walked right past it. My son was in there, as well as his friend, if I could rescue the two of them at least, that would make four of us who could potentially escape. Even if Steve was convicted of murder once we got back. Mr. Drescher was most certainly dead by now, but that wasn't really my fault. Except it kind of was since he tied him up to a chair and left him alone with a knife-wielding psychopath cannibal child. I tried not to think about that too much, and wondered instead if maybe the spark plugs were in the creature's hiding place as well. Wouldn't that be nice? Now all I had to do was get the Wendigo out of there for a few minutes so I could grab them. Searching my pockets, I tried to find something to use as a distraction. As soon as my hand settled on it, I knew what I had to do. Taking it out of my pocket, I punched in the numbers, then threw it into the woods as far as I dared. I just hoped it would work. I waited a few seconds, then the phone began to ring. Quietly at first, then louder and louder. 
It was the most obnoxious alarm clock I had ever used, but it worked through the set of earplugs I slept with, so I kept using it. The sound blasted through the forest and caused the Wendigo to run out of his hiding place. Clearly, this creature valued privacy above all else, and the alarm clock on my phone was giving away his hiding place. He darted into the trees on his long legs, and I took my chance immediately. I ran into the shack and found Greg and Peter both tied to chairs and gagged. It was a good thing they were both wearing thick winter coats, but regardless, they appeared severely hypothermic, especially Greg. His face was bright red and his eyes were glazed over and looked far away into the distance when I picked him up. He made no sound of happiness or surprise at my arrival. Peter was mostly the same, listless and quiet without expression of joy or happiness at our potential escape from death. Despite my concern at seeing my son looking this way, I gave him a big hug and was overjoyed to see him. I tried to tell myself he was just in shock. The spark plugs were sitting on a table in the small shack, and I grabbed them and stuffed them into my pockets. I took the boy's hands and we ran away from there as quickly as we could, while my cell phone alarm continued to blare in the woods. I heard a loud crunch and it stopped suddenly. We bolted through the forest until we were far away from there. Even though the boys didn't seem to have much spirit left in them, their desire to escape was obvious. It wasn't until later that I found out why. Once we got back to the car, I realized he wasn't chasing us anymore. It was like he had just let us go. I put the spark plugs back in after surveying the bloodbath inside the old cabin. Steve had surprisingly left Mr. Drescher unharmed. We found him sitting cross-legged on the floor in the pantry, snacking on pieces of Jeff. The two of them seemed unbothered by the freezing temperature, and had not bothered to maintain the fire. They seemed to enjoy the cold. He didn't react when I told him it was time to go home. Gibson jumped happily into the van, wagging her tail, but then whined with disappointment at our lack of progress once she was inside. The spark plugs worked fine and it started up no problem, but the van wouldn't move in the snow. I tried and tried, but it wouldn't budge. The blanket of snow was so thick that the van was stuck in it, despite all efforts to rock it back and forth to gain momentum. The clearance on it wasn't high enough, so there was no chance of us getting out of there without help from someone. Unless the snow stopped coming down and melted away considerably. If we risked walking back down the main road and trying to flag down a car, there was a chance of hypothermia, since it was a very long walk and the weather was dangerously cold. I brought the boys back inside the cottage, and surprisingly they didn't even scream at the sight of their dead friend, who had been partially dismembered and was now laying on the pantry floor in a pool of blood. The cabin smelled coppery like pennies, and I shut the door behind me and locked it. It looked like we would be spending the night in the cottage once again, I realized as I saw the sun going down. I would need to light the kerosene lamps and get a fire started, but at least now I had my son back, I thought to myself with a little relief. For some reason, although he looked like him, I had my doubts about Greg suddenly. This boy was no longer acting like my son. Gibson seemed to notice it too. He acted indifferent to her while they had always been best friends. She was growling at him quietly from under the table as he stared off at nothing. There was one other thing I couldn't help but notice. Greg looked like he'd had a sudden growth spurt overnight. My son appeared taller thinner as well. As I sat shivering in front of the small fireplace, poking the barely burning embers and hugging the dog for warmth, I considered many times just going out and sitting in the van, turning it on and starting the engine, and turning the heat to full blast. But I somehow knew that if I did it would mean certain death. Not only for me, but my son, Greg, his friend Peter, as well as Steve and Mr. Drescher. The van was buried in a snowdrift, rendering it immobile, and minute by minute that pile grew larger, surrounding it and us, burying us alive in the small cabin. The three boys were sitting shrouded in darkness at the furthest corners of the open room that made up the majority of the cabin. They seemed to dislike the meager warmth of the fire, 
and when I looked over, I saw their breath plumed visibly into the air. Yet they did not shiver or complain about the cold. A part of my mind kept telling me to tie up Steve since he had murdered Jeff, one of the other Boy Scouts, earlier that day. But the thought kept slipping away like memories of a dream upon waking. The fire seemed more important somehow in that moment. The low temperature and frost forming on the inside of the cabin, slowly creeping towards me, was making it hard to think of anything else. Mr. Drescher, much like the boys, seemed to be enjoying the cold. He was no longer humming or laughing, but simply sat staring at me from the chair he was tied to at the dining room table. My attempts at conversation were met with silence and hostility. Gibson was shivering, and I hugged her closer and tossed another log on the fire, which seemed to snuff out the remaining embers with its weight. Suddenly it felt even colder in the cabin, and the orange glow from the fire was gone, plunging us into darkness. Shit. Trouble with the fire? Mr. Drescher asked. No trouble. Just went out for a second. I felt a cold wind blowing from the front of the cabin. It stung my face with frost, and I realized the large wooden door was open, exposing us to the elements. But that was impossible. I had locked it myself. Unless one of the boys had somehow managed to sneak over and unlock and open the door quietly without my noticing. Had they done it quickly in the darkness when the fire went out? Had they just been sitting there waiting for the opportunity? Who the hell opened this door? I yelled at the boys, shining my flashlight around the room and doing a quick mental head count. The three of them were sitting in different dark corners of the room, and each one winced and hissed at me, like territorial street cats when I shined the light at them. They were hard to keep track of in the shadow-filled room. I needed more light, but was afraid to bring out the kerosene lamps. What if one of them got it into their distorted minds to knock the lamp over and start a fire? The realization that they were all against me suddenly solidified in my mind. The Wendigo psychosis. They all had it. And if I wasn't careful, I would be next. I got to my feet and went to the front door. Pulling it closed, I locked it once again and took a look out the small glass window at the top. It was now dark outside, but in the light of the moon I could still see the snow coming down blanketing the van and making it difficult to spot in the snowdrift. Getting out of there was suddenly seeming more and more hopeless. Who knew if the van would even start in this cold, now that the frigidness of night had set in. Staring at the snow coming down, I felt something scratching desperately at my leg and realized that I had been standing there for a while. I had zoned out completely, and saw the moon had moved from its previous position, indicating the passage of a substantial amount of time. I was trembling violently from the cold I noticed with a start. Hearing a sound behind me, I turned around to look. The room was cast in shadows, but I could see frost was forming on every surface and nearly reaching the wood stove at the center of the room where I'd been sitting. Gibson was at my feet, looking up at me worriedly and pawing at my leg. She was shivering and staring up at me with her big brown eyes. A bit of frost had formed on her muzzle and her nose. Her fur glistened with it in the moonlight, and I saw she was covered in icy specks of frost from the cold. I picked her up and brushed the ice off of her and hugged her, my heart hammering with fear, but not quite matching the chaotic pace of hers as I held her close to me. Walking back on unsteady legs, I found the boys were still sitting where I had left them. They had made no attempt to help with the fire or do anything at all, as far as I could tell. The frost was beginning to cover their hair and faces as they watched me unmoving. The ice, which formed like beards on them, made them look older than their age, and they watched me silently as I surveyed them. Mr. Drescher was likewise now covered in flecks of white frost, and his breath plumed out in front of him as he spoke. Are you ready to join his ranks, young Mr. Grip? He always has room for more in his house. His frozen mansion is large, is vast and empty cold and dark. It's waiting for you. When you're ready. Yeah, I don't think so. That sounds kind of terrible. I began to slice pieces of kindling from the dry wood near the fireplace. At least, I thought it was dry. 
the hell? The entire woodpile was soaked with water, I realized. Picking up one log after another, I found them each to be dripping wet. I went to the pantry and saw the entire massive jug we had brought with us as our drinking supply was gone, along with all of our food. The boys had dumped the entire jug of water on the firewood, soaking it completely and making it unusable. What they had done with the food was anyone's guess. He feeds on your hunger and your fear, I remembered Mr. Drescher saying. Was that what they were trying to do? Starve me and terrify me? Because it was working. I sat in front of the embers that had once been a fire. They were barely smoldering as I stuck my hands into the stove, attempting to gain any bit of warmth I could from it. My hands were trembling and shaking badly, but calmed a little when they soaked up a bit of the warmth from inside the fireplace. The heat seemed to rejuvenate my mind, and I was able to think clearly for a minute. Struggling to conceive of what to do, I decided to improvise. I took the axe and hacked the dining room chairs to pieces. Cutting them up smaller and smaller, I threw them in the fireplace and set them alight. The varnish made them catch quickly, and although the fumes were highly toxic and smelled terrible, it warmed us. Gibson and I huddled close to the fire, and I put my hands up to it. Watching the three boys closely from out of the corner of my eye, I cut up more pieces of furniture. Whatever I could find, I cut into small pieces. A table from the corner, picture frames and books, board games and ornaments, family heirlooms and knickknacks. Everything went into the fire. The frost, which was spreading inside the cabin like a virus, began to retreat slightly with the warmth of it and the light which glowed forth from the hearth. To hell with it, I decided. I grabbed the kerosene lanterns and lit them, turning the dials on the side to bring the wicks out and causing the flames to burn bright and hot, scorching the glass and causing black smoke to pour out. I didn't care. The room was suddenly bright and warm, and filled with toxic fumes, I'm sure. Fuck it. All three boys stared at me from the corners of the room, with the light and warmth came a bit of sanity, it seemed. I want to go home, said my son Greg softly. How? I asked him. I don't know how to get us out of here. The cell phone is gone and had no signal to begin with. We need help to get out of here and we're trapped. Smoke signals, Dad, said Greg. His eyes looked human again as he walked on shaking legs towards the fireplace and soaked up the heat from it. Peter walked over too, although Steve stayed sulking quietly in the corner. What's that, son? I asked, hopeful that this wasn't another trick being played on me by the Wendigo psychosis. Smoke signals. He... he hates the heat. The fire will keep him away, and the smoke... Smoke might draw in somebody if we can get a big enough signal. The boathouse. I realized suddenly what I needed to do. But the Wendigo would be waiting for me just outside, I was sure of it. Using the kerosene from one of the lanterns, I made an impromptu Molotov cocktail. I stuffed a dish towel inside an old liquor bottle and then set the end of it on fire. I opened the front door of the cabin and threw it as hard as I could towards the boathouse. The flaming bottle filled with kerosene smashed against the side of the wooden structure and it caught a light. Despite the howling wind, the fire spread quickly with the volatile propellant, and soon the entire building was on fire. I saw the Wendigo step out from his hiding place in the woods, where he had been waiting for us. He made eye contact with me, backing away from the giant pyre and retreating into the forest. The fire would bring more people, assuming anyone saw it and he didn't want to be seen by anyone. Once he was gone and with the fire burning high into the sky, everyone's sanity seemed to return slightly. Even Steve looked clear-eyed and remorseful as I saw him walk towards the pantry and look inside. Oh no, what did I do, Mr. Grepp? I killed Jeff. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. Were they actually clear from this strange spell? Or were they just waiting for me to let my guard down? I still didn't know if I could trust them or not. 
As the fire blazed higher into the night, the winter storm eased and dissipated until it was completely gone. With the snow no longer coming down heavily from above, the inferno became more obvious, and the glow of it was probably visible from a great distance. The sound of a helicopter eventually became audible, and the noise got louder and louder as it approached and landed on the icy surface of the lake near the cabin. I would later find out that someone else had been visiting the lake as well that weekend. They had been enticed by the reports of pleasant weather as we had been, and found themselves overtaken by the sudden storm. Luckily for us, their cell phone signal was slightly better at the other end of the lake, and when the snow eased up, they looked outside and saw the inferno, calling 911 at the sight of it. Fortunately, the fire died before it could spread to any of the surrounding trees or the cabin we were in. The kids told their stories as truthfully as they could, and of course, no one believed a word of it. Steve was arrested and subsequently found innocent by reason of insanity for the murder of Jeff. Ricky's body was never found, and ultimately I was cleared of any wrongdoing, since his parents agreed to his participation and understood the risks. Although Wendigos were never mentioned on the permission slip. So I guess I got away with one there. Peter's parents tell me he's never been the same since the events of that weekend. And I can definitely relate. Greg has never quite been the same either. He's been acting odd ever since it happened. We get together sometimes and talk about it. How the behaviors are the worst in the winter. When it gets the coldest. When they're hungry and when they're lonely. In the darkness of the night. That's when the boys do the strangest things. I really hope they don't have anything to do with the reports of all the missing people around town. Because those crimes are ongoing. And still haven't been solved. The people always go missing in the winter. On the nights when it's the coldest. When the snow is falling steadily and the black clouds are rolling in. Blocking out the light of the moon. That is when the hunt begins. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zwall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mama Cotto, Dante Kincaid, Zaren Ray, Angela Donovan, Larian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Bert Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves Anoya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm, Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, and Melanie Sanders. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you get access to bonus videos, content, and Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you all have a great night.